Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I want to thank everybody for um, joining us for our third webinar here. Um, Brian is going to be our presenter again. He did a great job the first webinar with just the overview of direct marketing of meat. Uh, last week we talked about um, direct marketing of red meats and today we're going to be talking about direct marketing of poultry which is totally different from looking at the red meats. And um, I'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to Brian and let him get started and as you have questions go ahead and ask. So thanks Brian for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. All right, thanks Debbie. Hopefully everybody's hearing me this morning. Um, I'm fighting my fall allergies, so if I get a little scratchy, you'll just have to bear with me. Um, hopefully everybody can see my lovely picture here with uh, with my, my chickens in the background. We're going to have a, a really different kind of topic today just from the standpoint that um, the regulations and, and rules that go with some of the poultry um, are very different from the other red meats that we deal with, uh, especially in the state of Missouri. And there are a lot of exemptions that we have to be aware of. And uh, I would say, number one, we need to proceed with uh, caution as we do uh, s some of these uh, poultry marketing uh, aspects. The first thing I'm going to do, I've got one slide that, that doesn't uh, isn't supported by Adobe Connect, so I'm going to we're going to show a blank screen here. But I've got to go out and and grab that uh, grab that slide for you guys to see, and we'll grab that right here. I want to start with some discussion about uh, if we look at historical per capita meat consumption in the U.S., I think something that's uh, probably very apparent to most of you listening is that poultry has made a uh, phenomenal charge from a consumption standpoint since 1950 in this country. Uh, this is actually a graphic that we put together based on USDA's uh, numbers for the last, well, up until 2005. And, in fact, these lines don't change much past 2005. But poultry has, has made uh, quite a resurgence um, in, into consumption in the American uh, household. Interestingly, uh, accompanying that, though, is uh, this um, buying local and uh, an effort for uh, folks that are going to grow their own food. And a lot of this uh, is driven uh, by the poultry business, or it's in the poultry business, because uh, poultry being a small animals, uh, it seems manageable for people to be able to participate uh, in, in uh, a chicken or a turkey enterprise uh, without a lot of overhead and a lot of capital investment. So uh, that's one graphic that I wanted to share with you here. Uh, we're going to go back, we'll go back to our original uh, presentation. There it is. I want to talk just real briefly about the value of poultry to the U.S. economy. And as the economy has slacked, uh, we have seen the, actually the value of poultry increase. Part of that's probably due to um, the, the, the price of poultry or the price of uh, food animal product going up in general since uh, early 2007. But if we take uh, some numbers from USDA and we look at uh, the value of broilers, eggs, turkeys, and chickens being uh, spent hens uh, from, laying, uh, from the laying industry, in 2008, these four categories had a combined value of about $36 billion to the U.S. economy. So uh, from a commercial standpoint, uh, poultry is huge, uh, economically speaking. This uh, is up 11% from 2007, so a pretty good uh, value increase here. And you probably saw this in the store a little bit. Uh, the value of eggs went up, uh, as well as uh, whole birds and some of the convenience-driven items. The biggest increase overall was in the value of broiler chickens at 64%. That's considering retail pricing. That's not the farm value, because uh, the reality of it is that those commercial producers are suffering just as much as everybody else in, in uh, the food animal business uh, with the economy. We talked a little bit in the first webinar about some of the demands that we're seeing and 
and part of it is uh, economically driven with the recession folks are looking more at uh, locally grown um, going into some uh, some comfort food areas and uh, we're seeing this uh, right here in the state of Missouri no doubt there is a an increase in demand for locally grown meats um, also some increase for some other labeling options such as uh, organic or natural we'll talk a little bit about that at the end uh, with some of the labels as uh, especially organic as it pertains to poultry and uh, the other thing that we visited about briefly in the first one was that uh, the number of farmers markets is increasing over the nation uh, in fact they've almost doubled in the last 10 years in the US so uh, certainly greater opportunities for some direct marking of meat and poultry products uh, but we have to be cautious how we proceed first thing that I guess we need to talk about then is uh, the, our ability to grow the birds and uh, I think the nice thing and I've alluded to it already about these poultry operations and direct marketing is that the initial capital investment to simply grow birds is not that great compared to some of the other species um, we can there are some really good web sources and we'll see if we can get linked up here yes uh, hopefully that's sharing for you. Um, this website uh, out of Atra has a unbelievable list of, of poultry publications. Brian, were yes. Were you going to the poultry pub to the Atra publication? Yes. Okay. Should have bounced to it. No, because on my screen I still see the PowerPoint slide. All right. Well, let me uh, go back and fix that. jump out of here and I'll go figure out how to share this with you all right that should be sharing uh, if it's not Debbie let me know um, so these are some of the publications the after publications they're in all kinds of different formats um, and uh, fairly easy to access but uh, what I think is good here there are all all different approaches and some of these are for um, the the free range outdoor access it's a systems approach um, some regulations related to um, organic and uh, there's even this entrepreneur's toolbox which is related to uh, growing a range poultry business I'm just going to click on that one and give you an idea of uh, Let's see how quickly we download here. Give you an idea of, of what's available through this. There it is. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the uh, the entrepreneur's toolbox, and uh, it it asks a lot of the questions that we talked about in the first webinar related to uh, the feasibility of our business, um, bringing the family aspect or the hobby aspect. Uh, how can we market the product? Uh, production uh, profitability these are some of the same things that we talked about with the other red meat species and uh, in all the appendices here there's a lot of things related to the budgeting of the programs um, processing uh, the birds and we're going to talk uh, a fair bit about the mobile processing units that uh, are in operation in some areas in the US and then some companies that actually build these mobile processing units and uh, th then there's some in appendix E is the small plant budget for those individuals that are actually going to go in and, and build a uh, have capital investment in some buildings on how to actually process those poultry so I would certainly uh, steer you towards uh, those uh, resources we certainly don't want to I don't want to recreate the wheels I've mentioned in the first one so um, that's one option for you to look at. Uh, related to that is uh, there's a book out there called Poultry Your Way. It's from uh, the folks up in Wisconsin and uh, I think I'll go ahead and bounce out and share that with you as well and show you this. Uh, you can buy this book but the easiest thing I think to do is uh, is to download it as a PDF and I've got it open here somewhere. your way. This is uh, 
This is a 130 page uh, publication. It's geared uh, towards some of these outdoor poultry uh, uh, facilities for the upper Midwest. So, uh, you know, we sort of fit into that, but I think if it works in the, in the cold states, then it will probably work here for us. I'm trying to work my way through here to give you an idea of, of what the offering is. So, uh, another similar approach to what we've talked about, but starting with some discussion about what are your resources, what skills do you have um, to, to bring this uh, kind of operation to the market. Um, there are some specific, um, specific case studies in here. There's one in here, this farm profile, that talks about some alternative species as it pertains to ducks. So we're not just talking about uh, free-range broilers or we're not just talking about laying hens. Uh, there certainly are some other opportunities uh, with uh, some alternative uh, fowl species that, that we could uh, deal with. Um, this is kind of an interesting publication in that uh, it does help you go through um, in, in Chapter 7 with the plan development. There are a lot of resources that are cited in the end of this publication as well. It speaks a little bit to uh, the free range or some semi-confinement, uh, birds that are just outside during the day and back in at night, uh, and, and it's really kind of a, a how-to cookbook approach, which uh, I think is good, especially for a lot of people that are just trying to start into this business. I think these things, these kind of resources become important because we talked in the first one, and I, I mentioned in the first one that uh, the first webinar that is that here in Columbia we are uh, we have a I guess a, get back to our presentation um, an initiative that's talking about actually having being able to have poultry in your backyard within the city limits of Columbia now it's going to be limited I do believe to laying hens but certainly there's that op opportunity uh, in some of these uh, not that Columbia is a huge metropolitan area, but in some of these areas uh, where folks are going to potentially get into this. A couple of pictures that uh, go with this slide um, are showing some really uh, probably low cost housing opportunities or housing options for poultry. I want to thank Debbie for uh, sending these to me. Um, and I think what this shows us is that you can get in this at a, at a relatively low cost. The other thing that we talked about before was at, at the end of the day, if your business isn't going to be successful, uh, what was the contingency plan to get out? And if you don't have a lot of money invested uh, on the front end, uh, the contingency to, to leave the business is, uh, is a little bit easier to swallow. As before, I, I like to talk a lot about the, the business, the operation of the business and budgeting and there is a, a real nice, uh, we had some from the University of Kentucky if you'll remember from the previous, if you were on with the previous webinar, uh, there is a real nice budget that uh, comes through the, the ATRA site and uh, it's in a form of an Excel spreadsheet so I'm going to bounce to that and uh, we'll get that thing opened up so we can look at it and I'll, uh, got this got this blown up hopefully to where you can see it. This is a very detailed um, budget that takes you through right down to the last penny as to how uh, a poultry operation uh, can be functioning and it accounts for pretty much anything that you can think of. Uh, it comes from uh, the Poultry Center of Excellence and uh, part of the Midwest Poultry Consortium and the folks up uh, in uh, Wisconsin. Now, if you look how this look at how this thing's laid out, there's an introduction here. Uh, talks a little bit about how you plug in information, and I think it's interesting that uh, if you're an experienced user, they say you can probably go ahead and use it. But uh, definitely, when all else fails, read the detailed instructions. So how here's how this thing's laid out. Uh, this is the intro page, simply in its own uh, worksheet here. There's a uh, an example budget. And I'll, uh, this bigger so we can see it. Let me share this. So there's an example budget uh, and the top here is the description of the enterprise. I'm going to make that a little bit bigger yet. So there's a description of the enterprise. It uh, talks about um, weight of the bird, description of the birds, what the value or the price for them being sold is, where they're being processed. 
and then it goes through what the receipts are. And this accounts for pretty much anything that, that you would do in one of these operations, whether it be from selling eggs, uh, which is highlighted here, all the way down to selling feathers or when we clean out the, the building at the end of the year uh, manure sales. So anything that would come from that operation can be accounted for in the receipts. And uh, over as we move to the right in this spreadsheet, uh, the number of units that you're selling, the value of that unit, and uh, the total value overall. And then just like a lot of the other uh, enterprise worksheets that we deal with, we have uh, inputs, uh, and this is going to account for variable costs for the production of the birds, uh, mainly the diets. As we move through it, there are the, the other variable costs related to um, housing and bedding and pretty much anything else that you can think of to go into this uh, it is plugged in. You then have the ability to charge cost uh, for fixed cost against your capital investment, whether that's uh, the buildings, uh, permanent and or portable, uh, different types of processing equipment, uh, whatever thing, other things that you've invested in. Uh, and the, the, so the spreadsheet will, and will roll to take care of that for you labor and management remember we have to make sure that our folks are charging uh, labor because well that's the honest way to make sure that the business is, is either making it or not uh, and then it, it'll calculate your returns now that's the that's the example version of the spreadsheet if we actually go over here let's look at uh, poultry budget number one and again I'll blow this up for everybody to, to get a better look at when you use the spreadsheet, we have to caution people that the calculations are going to occur at the top. So what we do is the inputs actually go at the bottom of this sheet. So what, what you tell your folks is you come down here to where you see yellow, and anywhere that's yellow is, is a typable field that you would add um, values to. So you can type text into the description in Enterprise just like we saw in the example and then uh, each of the uh, so if this is a build, building investment it can be plugged in in this box and notice that there are detailed instructions as to how to enter that value and uh, this one is dollars and a whole number and it's a beginning value so from the very very start even if you're you're currently building the business or you're thinking of building the business you can plug in numbers that will um, give you an idea of what kind of returns to expect. So as we scroll through this sheet, there's uh, non-capital. Um, so this is the birds. Whether you're raising them or purchasing them, you have to account for that. And notice that uh, you'll get these little uh, flags popping up telling you don't enter, enter a number here. All right. So it's only in the yellow for doing this budget. Uh, I've plugged a couple of, uh, of uh, examples into this and it's, it works pretty well. It looks real complicated, but at the end when you look at the calculations at the top, it's really pretty straightforward. I think you'll notice in the introduction that the authors wanted to make sure that they could account for really any size of poultry operation and pretty much any expense that, that could be plugged in. Uh, there's a couple of, there's a, actually a poultry budget number two that takes a little different look at this um, that may fit uh, a particular operation better. But, uh, so I think this, this is an invaluable resource when we start talking about um, our ability to, to actually uh, see, what we're, see what we have plugged into the system and if it's even going to be feasible at all. So I'm going to go back out here. So that's, that's the approach I would take in terms of growing the birds, uh, having folks look at uh, some of the husbandry aspects of it, the, the, the inputs. And then we get to some of the processing options. Poultry certainly is a different creature, a different creature in the fact that uh, it's the only one of our on-farm processed uh, meats that can go into uh, some retail streams and some end user streams uh, and with a, there are a lot of exemptions in, in this so the options that I think are intuitive to most of you is we have on-farm processing 
we have a state inspected facility and a federal inspected facility. If you were on with Dr. Clark last week, um, you got to hear a lot of these rules and regs and uh, some of the differences between the, the state and the federal. I'll touch on that just a little bit and uh, try to keep it as specific as I can to uh, the, the poultry aspect. So the, the on-farm processing is, uh, poultry is unique and it's only meat allowed to be sold after farm processing. Um, there are some caveats here and, and the one thing I, I will always say is uh, read the read the specs, read the rules, and then call somebody and talk to them about it as well if there's any doubt. Um, processors must slaughter animals raised on their own farm. So a lot of these exemptions we'll find uh, do not pertain to if you went to your neighbor and bought birds and then wanted to process them at your place and sell them, um, you, you no longer fall under the exemptions. Uh, even though we have exemptions in place, many farmers markets and other institutions, restaurants or, or whatever will not allow exempt from inspection product to be sold. So now I think you can see that there's a critical point here where if I'm going to sell in Kansas City at the farmers market or in Columbia at the farmers market, I need to do a little homework and find out that whoever is running the farmers market does in, in fact uh, allow exempt from inspection product to be sold there. Because if not, we, we've hit uh, uh, big obstacle number one. Uh, something that we there's some consideration for that uh, waste disposal for an on-farm processing facility. It's just like any other uh, meats facility. You have offal to deal with, uh, everything from feathers to internal organs and, and those types of things and you have to have a good contingency for handling that waste uh, whether it be uh, through a rendering or some other approved uh, method for disposal and some of this is driven very heavily by county ordinance or county health board ordinance um, so make sure that uh, we're looking into that as something that's kind of after the fact in, in some people's minds and uh, we don't want this off all stacked up somewhere uh, so that the neighbor can uh, file a complaint against us. So we'll, we'll spend some time here in the uh, the on-farm processing. Uh, certainly, as I've indicated, these, this is allowed under various exemptions, and uh, these these exemptions are mutually exclusive. So you can only operate under one exemption per facility per year. So you can't, if you're operating under the less than 1,000 birds exemption, and then you realize that, oh, we're going to do more than that uh, this year. Uh, if you're already operating under one exemption, you can't bump yourself to the under 20,000 exemption. So uh, it takes a little bit of planning and a little bit of understanding of the flow of the operation and the number of birds you're going to have uh, coming through your system. Even though we have processors that are exempt, there are some non-inspection provisions that uh, must be met according to Federal Meat and Poultry Act. Uh, and these are the four uh, sub-bullets here. Uh, not adulterated or misbranded product. Uh, every one of these exemptions uh, has to uh, be prepared under sanitary conditions, proper marking and packaging of the product, and then uh, there is a um, segregation from inspected products. So if we're operating uh, with a state inspected plant but poultry is being killed under an, uh, one of these exemptions, we're going to have to have uh, some separation of product from a storage standpoint. And a lot of that, it, it seems like common sense that you might be surprised uh, if you think about, well, we only have one cooler, we only have one freezer in this facility. Uh, we have to really make sure that we have a separation of product. Uh, the facilities must be constructed in a manner that allows the operator to maintain sanitary conditions and prevent the outside adulteration, whether intentional or unintentional, uh, of that product. Now this is, we'll find, this is where some of the mobile poultry units um, early on had a little bit of an issue because, um, as you can imagine, if it's a mobile unit, um, the one from Kentucky actually has um, uh, an additional area that's uh, attached to it uh, and, and they had a, a challenge in keeping that um, 
constructed in a manner where it was a sanitary condition all the time. We're not talking about something that's uh, concrete and steel that's nailed to the ground. So um, these kinds of things have to be kept in mind as we move into these different uh, exemptions. Now I'm going to go through the exemptions. Um, uh, when we get towards the end of this, I'm actually going to give you the link up to where these exemptions are specifically in, in the code. And uh, if, if there are questions about that, we can talk about that. Definitely the folks in Jeff City uh, are ones to visit with so pertaining to the state of Missouri. And then if we're talking about uh, interstate commerce, um, uh, th these exemptions uh, don't apply there. So we'll start with the first, which is uh, the one that probably doesn't uh, pertain to this direct marketing because this is the personal use exemption, the not for sale product. Uh, all of these on the labeling should indicate what exemption you're operating under. Uh, this particular personal use exemption is PL 90-492. And I'll give you the link to what those different uh, exemption codes are. This is simply at the poultry slaughtered by the producer and the grower and it's for personal use uh, by that producer, their family, a uh, non-paying guest or employee. So essentially this is this is poultry that you're going to use at home and or uh, that you're going to give to people um, or friends and, and there's no money changing hands. Uh, so we cannot sell this product and it cannot be donated to go into the food chain. And uh, I encountered a, a situation over in uh, in Illinois with a, with a group that so folks had, had grown some birds out and they wanted to donate to uh, one of the local food pantries and uh, because of, of the structure of the exemption they could not donate that in, in for use as human food in the food chain. So uh, something to keep in mind. For personal use there's no limit to the number of birds you can slaughter uh, the, but as we go back and we think about some of those federal statutes the birds must be healthy at the time of slaughter. Uh, it's just one of those things where we don't want to um, knowingly um, introduce a, a, a foodborne illness issue into the, the food chain. And you say, well, you know, I wouldn't knowingly uh, give uh, foodborne illness to my friends, but we want to make sure that those birds are healthy when we slaughter them. The next exemption is the custom exemption. Um, a lot of birds were processed under the custom exemption in Missouri for a long time. I think we're going to find when we get to the end of this that getting uh, birds processed, poultry processed in the state of Missouri is a very, very challenging uh, task at the moment. Uh, the custom exempt processors do not own or ever sell the, the pult poultry that are killed. They're simply the processing service. Uh, when I was doing some of this uh, uh, from a custom standpoint, working with the processor up in uh, Clarence, Missouri. Um, th this is, I just took my birds in in the morning, they processed them, dropped them into a chill tank, and that afternoon I had to go pick my birds up. So they were simply um, a, a contract service that was, was processing the bird for me. I was paying them for the service. Money never changed hands regarding uh, the actual poultry meat. Um, this is uh, done under Slaughter and processing is done in accordance with sanitary standards, and again, the poultry have to be healthy at the time of slaughter. Now we start to get into some exemptions that are probably more related to our direct marketing. At the the end of these exemption discussion, I have a, a chart that has everything in one spot, so you can look at it. Uh, it's probably the most useful for you as you work with producers and as an educator and show people um, uh, what, what op options there are and what opportunities there are for sales. Um, this producer grower is the 1,000 limit exemption, so the producer can slaughter no more than 1,000 of their own birds for distribution as human food. Same rules in terms of processing and sanitary conditions. This is where some record keeping now uh, becomes important because you are subject to um, to uh, record inspection. So you have to keep records uh, related to enforcement of the Federal Meat and Poultry Act. So you need a, a slaughter record and a sales record so you have some idea uh, of how many birds are going out of your system. And uh, so there's some more, there's a much greater level of policing that, that's involved in these exemptions. Um, <clears throat> 
no uh, provision for interstate commerce. So this is strictly in-state. So for us, uh, strictly trade here in the state of Missouri. And again, we're dealing with, with healthy poultry. The next step to that is uh, the 20,000 limit exemption. Uh, all of the same rules apply as the 1,000 limit exemption, except we've added one here at the bottom that the facilities will be inspected occasionally for sanitation. So really the, I think the, the crux of it here is that as we see more and more birds going into the food chain from one source, uh, the, the opportunity for um, whether it's a foodborne outbreak uh, or some uh, chink in the armor of food safety can occur. So now we're seeing um, a, greater, a greater inspection um, and, and greater policing of the facility. Now remember that within that year, if I'm operating under the 1,000 limit exemption, uh, if I go over that, I cannot simply bounce to the 20,000 limit exemption uh, within that year. So they're mutually um, exclusive exemptions annually. As part of this, uh, and this is where it gets a little bit gray, but um, so we've got producer grower, and then there's what's called other person 20,000 limit exemption. And this is. Uh, pertains to direct marketing of poultry and I've highlighted here so the grower can slaughter and process their own birds and then what we're talking about is a direct infusion of this poultry into the food chain so to the end user um, or well technically uh, to the person that will serve the end user but this goes to meals that are served or sold directly to customers. So this is, uh, it mitigates the uh, wholesaler aspect. And then uh, the person who purchases live poultry from a grower slaughters and processes such poultry for direct sale. So here's where we now have the one piece that you as the grower are not nece don't necessarily back up, you as the processor uh, are not necessarily the grower and that's uh, but this is direct pertaining uh, bullet number two direct uh, pertains to direct meals uh, sold directly to that customer so this is where there becomes a little bit of a gray area in these exemptions and uh, certainly we'll visit the, the actual uh, the actual rules as they're laid out I'll give you that uh, what, what the code and the, and the directives are on that So as we look at that exemption that I just showed you, um, everything is the same, limited to less than 20,000 birds, uh, cannot be sold to a distributor or retail store. Okay, so that's the caveat there. So we're not going into distribution for that person to send it out to another person to then sell it to the, to the end user. So we have to make sure that uh, we have the right end user in mind when we're using this producer grower or other person exemption. Everything else is the same. There's no interstate commerce here, um, healthy poultry, and the slaughter and processing is conducted under sanitary standards. The last exemption I want to talk about, and then I'll see if there's, there's questions or if we need to clarify here, uh, is what's called the small enterprise exemption. Uh, this was, uh, I think, the most recently added of the poultry exemptions. And so here we have a, pr a producer or grower who's going to raise, slaughter, and dress poultry to go into human food chain. Um, this is limited to the cutting up of poultry when we talk about processing. So <clears throat> that we have a producer that does that, and that's limited to the cutting up of the poultry. We have a business that purchases live birds whose processing of the poultry is limited to cutting up and then the business that purchases dressed poultry and that their step is limited to the cutting up uh, and then in this case of inspected or exempted poultry for distribution. So we've got this really I think was a, um, a meeting in the middle uh, to let very small operations 
uh, get to the point where they can sell uh, cut up poultry but then not go into um, a, a total further processing into uh, lunch and meat or something like that. So these small enterprise exemptions uh, pertain to the, just the cutting up uh, of those uh, carcasses. Uh, related to that, and, and what this does, this really frees up some of these small businesses to, to now sell locally. Um, so what we're talking about then is, and this would be the processing, and we've, we've brought in inspected poultry now into the discussion. So now it can be either federally inspected, state inspected, or exempt poultry. All we've done is cut up the carcasses. Uh, we do mo no more than 20,000 birds a year in the calendar year and if that is the case then small enterprise exemption has the ability to sell to these uh, five categories <clears throat> so now we're household consumers hotels retail stores restaurants or similar institutions and uh, I always caution people similar institutions I don't I wouldn't make that designation on my own I would definitely call um, the state of Missouri in this case and find out uh, if what you're thinking of is considered a similar institution under the definition of this uh, small enterprise exemption. So this is the the summary of the exemp exemptions and the limits uh, on a calendar year basis. So I think as I stated before this is probably going to be one of your most useful um, tables when you when you're talking to folks that are growing birds out there in the state and uh, indicating what can you do what can you not do and uh, if, if we go through this the criteria um, if we look at custom you know, customs really the all we can do is, is process the bird and that goes back to the person that owns it there's no distribution uh, and then as we move to the right in the table the uh, the ability to sell to more outlets is here, and uh, the ability uh, to, to get those into retail. But keeping in mind, there is no interstate sale of this product. Um, a few of these have the ability to go into retail, <clears throat> and a few of these do not. So, I think I'll pause there just for a minute. Um, I know that can kind of get a little uh, crazy in terms of what can I do, what can I not do. Are there any any questions pertaining to that? And certainly, you'll have this information. So, um, yes. See, I think it looks like Bob has his hand up. No. Okay. Looks like you're on. Yeah. My question is, uh, if we have a grower or a small processor that's uh, <coughs> near one of the border states, like uh, Arkansas or Kansas, uh, and they're primarily selling in Missouri, uh, they would need to meet the standards of those adjacent states or check with their departments of agriculture, I guess, since selling it over the state line, you know, if they're within a few miles of the state line, uh, constitutes interstate commerce, they, they would run afoul of federal regulations if they weren't um, essentially approved in both states then, is that right? That's correct. Uh, essentially, it, you are then uh, you're under federal statute at that point for interstate trade, interstate commerce. So even if uh, so, if the, if the birds are uh, grown and, and originated uh, in the state of Missouri, they can't they can't go across the border. Even if you meet the statutes of the state across the way, uh, this is completely um, controlled by by federal statutes for interstate commerce. So. Those birds would have to be federally inspected uh, in order to go into the interstate trade. Which I understand, you know, that it's it's a little problem if you are certainly close to the bordering state somewhere uh, and you can't do business across the river, as it were. Uh, but we are bound by those federal statutes, and that's that's a good question. Are there any any other questions uh, pertaining to that? And I know as we get into the the southern part of the state, um, we we, uh, we probably have a lot more birds being grown, and, and some of those uh, issues with interstate trade um, uh, can can be problematic. 
Okay. Let's talk just a, I believe, a few I believe, Stacy, you have yes, your hand Debbie? up. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see. Go ahead, Stacy. Yes, uh, regarding the interstate trade, it sounds like I'm trying to circumvent rules here, but if you had visitors coming into Missouri that was from Arkansas, which is only, you know, 10 miles away from us, uh, and they buy poultry products, that's not a problem, correct? Uh, I believe that is correct, actually, Stacy. They're in. It's uh, it's similar to uh, buying alcohol in one state and uh, as for personal use and taking it home. So uh, I, I don't think that that's an issue because they're actually doing business. You are doing business in your state. Um, if anybody has any other anything they'd like to to add to that, feel free. Um, but I think it's very similar to, I mean, as long as you're doing business within your state, um, you're, to the best of your knowledge, you're abiding by those, those rules and statutes. Brian, I haven't heard you mention anything about um, whether the birds need, the customers need to come to the farm to pick up the birds or if they can actually take them to the market or if they can take the birds to the restaurants. Um, or is that in an upcoming slide or is that something that needs to be addressed now? It's probably something we should talk about. Um, I, I think the, the, the water's a little muddy here, unfortunately, and I'm trying to, I've tried to find something that's kind of the uh, end-all, be-all to that, that discussion. I actually think that there, I think there's an opportunity for, um, for that to work both ways, Debbie, and if, if you know different, let me know, but um, I have seen where uh, those those birds can be picked up as long as we've met all of the the rules and the exemptions. Those birds are properly packaged, and now they're they're either frozen or chilled or whatever. I think those can either be picked up or they can be delivered. But I think it's the it, more of an issue of. Um, um, being distributed under uh, uh, sanitary conditions or having good food safety conditions. So if I'm going to uh, take those to a restaurant uh, as chilled birds or frozen birds, I certainly want to do make that distribution, uh, keeping them chilled and or frozen in, in the delivery. But I, I can't find, and I've been looking for this, and, and I'll continue to try to find that aspect, but there's not much that talks about the actual distribution uh, from farm to to that institution or to that retailer. Um, Debbie, do you have any? Do you know of anything that's well, specific I don't, to that? Well, I'm not a law person, and and so I've not read everything, of course. But how I thought I understood it to be is that if you process on the farm, then I need to go to the farm to pick it up, and that's how it happened as far as me uh, purchasing poultry. Um, around from the Columbia market. Now I know that there are a couple of folks that do sell the birds at the market. Um, the one lady I know she takes her birds down to Aurora and has them processed in a facility down there and so therefore she can sell the birds at the market um, and her birds are always whole. Um, I don't know about um, show me because they've got birds I don't know if he processes them on the farm or if he sends them out I'm not sure about that but he sells his birds at the market I do have um, a producer I know down in the southwestern part of the state and she actually sells birds um, to different stores smaller stores and she also sells them whole and cut up and I know that she does not process them herself but I thought I had the understanding that if you do on-farm processing, you needed to go pick them up from the farm. And that if you were selling them off the farm, in other words, at a location or to a restaurant, that they needed to be done in a licensed facility. Now, perhaps I'm wrong, but that's how I had understood it. Okay. Crystal, do you have something to add?
Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I was under the same as understanding as you were. If it was going to be processed under the exemptions on the farm, then it had to be picked up at the farm. And that actually makes a lot of sense because what it does is it, it mitigates some of the, the liability uh, in the distribution from the farm to whoever the next user is. It puts the liability on the person that's buying the poultry uh, so it it saves some of the liability on the, on the, the farm or the producer themselves. And which that makes perfect if, sense. If I'm correct also with this, and Crystal you can add in as well, but that, that understanding that Crystal and I have um, it's no matter if you do 1,000 or up to 20,000 processing on the farm. It's just that if it's on the farm or if it's in a, in a processing facility. And it, that's how you also understand it, Crystal, too, right? Is no matter if it's 1,000 exempt or 20,000. Yeah, that's how I understood it to be as well. I mean, obviously it could be wrong, but um, the last time I dealt with this and kind of called around to get information, it seemed like if there was an exemption, if you were working under the exemptions and doing something on the farm, then the product had to stay on the farm until it went to a consumer directly. Okay, good. Thanks Thanks for the input, Debbie and Crystal. Um, <clears throat> and I'll try to find, I'll try to find that in the statute so that we have that for sure uh, in some follow-up materials uh, after today. Um, want to make just a few comments uh, j just to reiterate where we're at because that, that's all dealing with exempted product. Uh, we want to talk just a minute here about state inspection and uh, federal inspection. Got a couple of links here that will uh, get us to the right folks in the state of Missouri. We may not necessarily go uh, deep into those links, but you'll have those as to who you need to talk to uh, related to uh, processing poultry in the state of Missouri for state inspection. Uh, just a couple of things. The state inspection is, is equal to uh, federal inspection uh, in its uh, in its ability to uh, make sure that we have a safe product, a, a wholesome, wholesome product going into the market. Uh, the big difference here is that if it's uh, through a, a state inspected facility, uh, that product's going to go out um, with the uh, state of Missouri uh, label and or mark on it, and that does not qualify for interstate trade um, or interstate commerce. Uh, when we're working under state inspection, we have a, a whole set of our uh, SSOPs, our sanita Sanitation Standard Operating Procedures, as well as being subject to HACCP. So this adds uh, a couple more hurdles from a food safety standpoint, and that's why that we then have the ability to, to have more um, ability to sell into a lot of different markets because of this uh, these different hurdles for food safety and or the wholesome uh, production of this product. Um, the link that's at the bottom of the slide, I don't think we'll bounce out to it right now, but this uh, takes you to the Missouri Department of Ag uh, and to the government page that gets to uh, health and inspections. And <clears throat> this has a listing of all of the state inspected plants for food animal production in the state of Missouri. I will tell you right now that uh, there are very few, uh, just maybe two or three that are actually processing poultry under state inspection. Um, let me back up. Very few, uh, very few that uh, there's, there's no member of the Missouri Association of Meat Processors right now that processes poultry. And that's the kind of the governing body or the, the association within the state. Now there are um, a few plants that are not members of the Missouri Association of Meat Processors that do process poultry. Uh, under state inspection uh, and th I've had some difficulty finding those plants uh, that are processing poultry. So uh, this becomes a bit of a challenge if you do want to uh, abide by state uh, and or uh, federal inspection for poultry. Um, <clears throat> I say that it's very, very, very limited in Missouri, uh, at least from a small uh, processing standpoint. Obviously we have some very large commercial processors in Missouri but uh, I think everybody's aware that those are linked to some vertically integrated or vertically coordinated businesses 
and the ability to be in those plants does not uh, really exist in any form or fashion. Um, I think we will gonna see how we want to do this. I'm going to have to share my screen with you here, I think. If I can get linked out of here. I want to talk just a little bit about uh, some of the processing units and um, some stuff that's kind of new on the horizon. All right, I'm going to have to bounce out to my other one to share with you. So, do this. All right. Um, for some, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the eExtension um, website that links up extension uh, groups from, from other states and then it's funneled back in through uh, University of Missouri Extension. So that's where I've linked up here and I'll, I'll share these, uh, these links with you. But Kentucky has the mobile poultry processing unit and this falls under the category of small meat processors. And uh, if we come in here and, and we can look at some of uh, the basic information with a mobile unit. And this is something that I think could be uh, real beneficial for Missouri uh, if we could find some people that actually wanted to, to jump into this venture, uh, especially if we had a, a nice geographic area of producers where this could be used uh, on a regular basis and, and some of the initial capital investment uh, could then be uh, spread across a lot, the cost could be spread across a lot more units of birds uh, being killed. The one out of Kentucky is an interesting one in that uh, it has about a 400 bird capacity on a daily basis. Uh, if you read through this, and some of you are probably from, uh, as familiar or more familiar with this than I am, but this is a multi-species approach where they, they have the ability to process chickens, turkeys, pheasants, and quail, or they, they do or have done that, and then they actually also uh, have the ability to, to process aquaculture. And in this case, it's uh, harvesting of caviar, uh, paddlefish, and then uh, prawns, uh, shrimp prawns. Uh, this is a, a rental unit, and uh, I talked earlier about that. Uh, one of the challenges of having sanitary um, facility and, and uh, construction so that you can have a sanitary working environment. The trailer itself is a 160 square foot unit. And then it has what they call a docking station, which is kind of the work area uh, under undercover to actually handle the, the animals. Um, this has been an interesting venture. You, you can see the pricing here. It's $75 for the first 50 chickens and then 75 cents each uh, beyond that. And then uh, whatever the additional um, materials are to go into this. As we scroll down here, this is actually the the original design so it was a an aluminum enclosed uh, trailer unit with this uh, what they called their docking station attached to it um, this operates as a uh, let me back up I mean uh, yeah inspection it's neither state approved and and, and it operates under exemption so uh, I think there's probably a, a, a whole set of other hurdles that are involved if you wanted the mobile unit to be state inspected, but I think there's actually the opportunity for that to happen. And there's precedence for that in other parts of the country. Uh, up in Washington State, there's a red meat uh, mobile slaughter unit that's actually killing uh, large animals, and uh, those, uh, those can operate under, uh, under state inspection. So there's precedence for that to occur. Uh, I think that uh, just based on design of these uh, facilities, uh, that's a, a little greater hurdle to overcome. <clears throat> so that is the, the actually the, the Kentucky one. Uh, I have, I'm going to try to share with you again here. I just need to find the right spot. Got a lot of files open here. Bear with me. Um, go back to our go back to our original presentation here so I can find the link. I think I'm going to have to link out to this one and then share it with you again. Okay. 
got another slide in here that talks about it. Okay. So, <clears throat> question about uh, where can these... Uh, now we're going to have to go back out and share. I've got it to link up. Who builds the units? Uh, there actually are several, uh, and some of these are manufacturers that you're familiar with, but um, Trivan Truck Body is out in, in Washington State, and that's actually, I, I said there was precedence for that. They actually create uh, units that are fully equipped that will satisfy USDA inspection. So, um, it's a 25,000 uh, gross vehicular weight on this unit, and uh, there's a pretty good lead time. But this Trivan will actually uh, build these units. Uh, Featherlight, uh, those of us here in the Midwest are probably uh, familiar with Featherlight. Uh, they will also build these, and I think, let's just cross our fingers and hope we can get bounced out to this. Yeah. This is the one of the Feather uh, Featherlight units. Nope, I'm wrong. This is the Trivan unit at the top. It's a 36-foot unit that's on the on a semi. Here's a, a picture of the the Featherlight unit. So there are a number of these that are fully enclosed and uh, have the the ability, uh, if you will, to meet some USDA specifications. Uh, so you've got you will have all the links to this. Um, I apologize for some of the little bit disjointed just because um, Adobe Connect doesn't support some of these file types so we have to bounce back and forth. So let me get us back out to our regular presentation here. Okay. So we'll talk, I'll, I'll show you some more pictures, we'll talk a little more about the mobile units here and just, here we go. This is a, uh, a mobile unit um, and the link to it and, and, and credit for these pictures is actually here at the bottom, the farming connection uh, from the pasture poultry uh, aspect of that page. This is a little bit different. Uh, so this is an open trailer. Um, it's probably maybe a little bit difficult for you to see it, but there, there are killing cones on one end of this. Uh, the, the scalding tank is built into this unit and then uh, the uh, plucking or the, the uh, defeathering um, is also built in. So this unit comes in, um, the gentleman is uh, the killing cones here where these birds are bled, then they go through into the scald tank, then they go into this uh, plucking or uh, defeathering unit, a single unit, and then they get uh, right out into the, the uh, chilling bath, which there's a, a cold chilling bath that's also on the trailer. So that's an example of maybe a, a mobile processing unit that's not as complicated, but it certainly uh, serves the purpose. And uh, if you go into this uh, link, they talk about uh, two people being able to kill about 40 birds an hour. So if it's a two-person operation, uh, you can move through 40 birds an hour. <clears throat> so if and, and maybe I've kind of got, got us a little bit disjointed here, but if we think about um, those kinds of units and, and those would have, if you want to uh, kill under inspection, they would have to satisfy the state of Missouri's um, statutes. And for those, um, let's see if we can link out here. Poultry inspection for the state of Missouri, there's uh, PDFs that go to, to those. And we'll go out and I'll, I'll show you these and then I'll give you the link to those as well. Um, to show you what we have. Okay. First thing we got here is if you want contact for meat and poultry inspection, I've included the, uh, the different uh, regional divisions for contacting uh, meat and poultry in the state of Missouri and the names of the individuals that are responsible for those areas. So you'll have this information uh, pretty nicely laid out and that uh, you know which region you're in and where your county falls and, and who you need to get in touch with. So that's uh, one opportunity there just for some contact with the state. Um, this is the uh, 09-2010 poultry yearbook. Um, I think this is a really good source for just about anything that has to do with poultry in the state. 
uh, everything from who is at the Missouri Department of Ag in terms of uh, staff members to talk to, uh, the Animal Health Division, if you need to do uh, diagnostic testing or sending samples off, anything like that. We actually have the contacts here at the university uh, in our, our Division of Animal Science. And then pretty much anybody else that you can think of. Um, all the way through the, the different associations, uh, the hatcheries, uh, and, and these are very detailed, right down to uh, what breeds uh, these hatcheries offer, um, availability, timing, uh, things like this. So pretty much anything that's involved with poultry in the state of Missouri, whether it be traditional and or um, some alternative things, whether it be emu or some of the game birds or things like this, they are all in uh, the, the poultry yearbook. So you'll have that uh, linked up as well and available to you. Um, we've been talking about the exemptions a little bit. They're actually, um, these are the exemptions laid out by USDA and it's uh, part 381 and then you have all the subparagraphs to it and if you really like to read the legalese uh, you can go through this. Um, I've linked, I've only pulled out the piece that's the exemptions that we've talked about and uh, you'll have this uh, in, in the legal language if you need it um, and I tried to put it in, in a little more um, boiled down version in those previous slides. So those are the, those are the exemptions uh, as they're written. Okay, let's back out here. So <clears throat> we visited about the um, that particular piece of the code is uh, section 381. I've included the phone number on here if you want to get a hold of a real living breathing human being to talk to. Um, the, the inspection exemptions are on here. Um, there's also a link to the label exemption um, that, that is in there as well and that's all, all included. If you need to talk to uh, the folks in Missouri that are specifically involved in, in the health side of the poultry business, um, there's the email link right here. It's poultry at mda.mo.gov. Um, the program coordinator is, is Rose Foster, and then we have some of the animal health officers uh, that are linked to the Missouri Poultry Health Program as well. So. There's really a lot of information, a lot of people we can contact uh, pertaining to kind of the rules and regs from everything from growing the bird to, to getting the bird uh, down the road in a package uh, to the end user. The federal inspection aspect of this, um, this goes back to our discussion about the interstate commerce and if you're going to trade across the state lines, um, you need to be federally inspected. Uh, the other thing is that the federally inspected product is also eligible for export. Uh, some of these really small operations probably don't even have export on their radar, but you never know how a program might grow. Um, or you may make some contact with someone that says, you know what, I think that um, this kind of product could, could work and uh, could go into export. And, and there's, there's a jumping off point there, I suppose. So. Uh, but you have to be federal inspection for that to, to happen. Just like the state inspection, we're, we're uh, subject to SSOPs and to uh, in being in accordance with the HACCP plan uh, for food safety considerations. We'll talk a little bit about the label claims as they pertain to poultry. And uh, we have a handful of these that. <coughs> that are interesting. So we'll go through, I'm going to mention a little bit about the free range, uh, natural, and then some about the organic label and uh, as they are written today. The free range, uh, simply put, free range means they must have access to the outside. Okay. If you read this specifically, there's no other specified criterion about environmental quality, uh, number of birds, space per bird, uh, no other criterion uh, related to free range are written into that. Okay. So nothing about stocking density. So it's simply about being outside. 
birds have access to the outside. Regarding the natural claims, we have ended up with a little more um, defined version of natural because in its simplest form for the last, I don't know, last many, many decades, natural simply meant that the, the product contained no artificial ingredients, flavors, or colors. Um, we have added the chemical preservatives and is only minimally processed uh, to the natural label. Minimally processed is um, whatever it takes to make the food edible, so that falls under traditional processes. So that's either taking it to the, to the carcass, uh, traditional processes of preservation, and things that we do to make the product safe. So that falls under minimally processed. Then they have the physical processes that don't fundamentally alter, alter the raw product. So, or make it uh, be different from a whole food. Uh, so that, that falls into our, our, our physical processes. So we can cut the chicken up, and we can put the chicken in a bag and it's cut up parts. That would be minimally processed. So that can fall into the natural claim. Now if we start going into making chicken hot dogs, then that's a, a different game. Some other label claims that um, that require some documentation, and we, we talked about this in the in the first of these uh, seminars, about uh, if you're going to make the label claim, you certainly want to have the ability to document and back that label claim up. Uh, some other claims that, that you'll find on uh, on some of the poultry is there's uh, no added hormones. Um, we can't use uh, hormones in, in raising poultry anyway, uh, added hormones. But I think it's interesting that uh, I've seen a couple of labels recently and I've actually talked to the individuals about it and it just strictly says no hormones. And uh, that in itself is, um, I would argue, is absolutely not true. Um, all chickens have hormones of some sort, so you, you, it's no added hormones uh, it would need to be the label claim. Um, and then no antibiotics uh, in the production of those birds. Um, and we need sufficient documentation here um, to whoever this agent, to, to the agency demonstrating that the animals were raised without antibiotics. So it goes back to some record keeping um, and just uh, taking care of your business mainly. I'll say just a little bit about the organic side. Um, I've actually got an entire uh, presentation on organic as it pertains to, to meat in general and if some of you would like to have that I can certainly send it to you. Uh, I did that at one of the in-services uh, last year uh, here on campus and if, if you want the specifics on organic I can send that to you. Uh, certified organic for the poultry is that they must uh, be under continuous organic management no later than their second day of life. Uh, the feed ration must be composed of organically produced products. That includes pasture and forage for those outside birds. Um, and then we fall under the, the rules of the, the no drugs, no added hormones, or antibiotics in that product. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the the organic label. I think a lot of you have some familiarity with that. Um, and certainly if you're going to go this route, um, there there is some homework that you certainly have to do in order to uh, get it back into the organic label, especially uh, now that we have a uh, specific uh, designation from the USDA. Um, related to that, uh, the housing is an interesting discussion. Um, the housing should protect the birds from the elements, maintain a comfortable temperature, provide ventilation, clean bedding, and allow them to conduct natural behaviors. Well, that's uh, that's a pretty broad definition. It's, there's probably some room to operate within that. Uh, caging of the birds is not permitted in the uh, certified organic housing, according to the label or according to the statute. Uh, birds have to have access to the outside for exercise, fresh air, sunlight, and must be able to scratch and dust bath. So those are pulled specifically out of the, the organic language um, according to USDA. 
There is no specification for stocking densities um, that I could find in the National Organic uh, Program label. <clears throat> the USDA has a website that's just chock full of information rela related to the organic label. Um, and you can find that pretty easy. Um, search in USDA's page under the National Organic Program for NOP. And again, if you want more on that, I can certainly send you uh, some of that information in, from a different uh, presentation that we've given here on campus. <clears throat> I want to talk just a little bit about general label requirements. Um, and the idea here is we just want to prevent a misbranding or a misrepresentation of, of what we're selling to our, our customer. So if we take general label requirements, um, and this this is getting into the kind of a little bit of the legal discussion on labeling, and I'll talk about who can apply for labels and things of this nature. But the product name obviously needs to be on there. If we're dealing with an inspected product, we want the legend of inspection on there, whether that's the state legend or the, the federal legend. Um, if Generally there will be a handling statement on there, uh, it, keep it refrigerated or it will say if frozen, keep frozen. Uh, uh, net weight of the product, uh, we may have our address or signature line on there as our business. Um, certainly when we're talking about inspected products we have to have safe handling instructions on it. Um, ingredients if there are two or more and then there is exemption on the nutrition labeling and if you're I don't know if you remember when nutrition labeling uh, first came on as uh, as a requirement but there are exemptions for the small business side and for single ingredient products um, so nutrition facts don't have to be on on everything and in this case if we're simply selling a chicken um, that's a single ingredient and we're exempt from the nutrition facts uh, as it were. So those are general label requirements uh, for these birds. There's an example here uh, of a label that has uh, most of these kinds of things on it. There's a net weight and there's a, a processing date um, and the address and contact information. And this is critical from a standpoint if you ever had an issue um, and we needed to do some traceback or some recall, um, that the, the label is obviously there for a reason. Um, when we talk about the actual process of applying for label claims, um, they're only accepted from the plant, not necessarily from the producer. And labels can only be applied at the plant, that the, at the plant where the label is approved. So these are a couple of things that um, you probably don't stop to think about. In order for the processor to make the label claims, some of the label claims that I've talked about, they must be inspected product, and then there should be, or there must be, uh, supporting document documentation uh, for those claims. <clears throat> and I think this is, uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting spot to talk about, <clears throat> and I made this comment before in a previous uh, webinar that um, if you're at the farmer's market and you've got your your board up there and you're advertising uh, certain healthy aspects of the product and uh, you know that and, and I don't know we, we can use an example uh, more omega-3 fatty acids from animals that are on uh, grazing uh, pasture um, that that may be true um, but it probably helps your sales if you can cert support that with some sort of documentation from your own product now I know that isn't specifically on your, it may not be on your label, uh, it's just in your advertising materials, but I think we need to uh, caution our, our um, producers uh, that, uh, you know, if you're going to advertise it, you really should have something to back it up and, and make sure that that's true, uh, not just something that we assume to be true because our animals are grazing or, or free range or something of that nature. There's a lot more information regarding labeling on, on meats, both uh, from Missouri Department of Ag and then FSIS uh, uh, of the USDA, and that information is readily available there. Um, so I would encourage, if there's questions regarding this labeling, uh, to contact those agencies. 
which brings us to uh, some pricing and uh, hoping I can link out to these. Uh, there's some really neat publications out here that talk about this. Um, I'm going to try to I think I can get this one to come up. Yep. I'm going to share this one with you first. Some of you may be aware of this publication and, and uh, I saw this one up the other day. Um, this is Farmers Markets Today, a business journal for direct to customer marketers. And this is actually a, an article that was written in here about uh, uh, the market being good for, for chicken uh, at, at the farmers markets. And uh, a lot of discussion, and this is actually has a little bit of a case study that talks about um, how the poultry sales for this one particular operation has increased 72% uh, over some period of time. But th these are some places that we might be able to point our people that have, I'll say it's uh, maybe more testimonial than uh, actual market research, but it gives, an I gives folks an idea of you know, what kind of things can you charge, um, you know, where can you, you know, how, how can you test the market uh, that you're currently residing. Uh, and then there's a lot of things in here about um, how you might change your system to fit a uh, to fit a, a cyclical or a seasonal market, um, so there's I'll, I'll make sure I have this link in here. It's interesting that uh, there's a comment in here that talks about rising feed cost. So uh, it talks about feed cost for poultry going up 75 percent in the last three years. So they had to raise their price from uh, 3.50 a pound to four dollars a pound for their pasture raised chickens. Um, it's interesting how the laws of economics come into play here though. He doesn't want to raise his price too much so he says I would suggest raising a larger flock to offset the rising costs. Um, it, raise, it takes as much time to raise a thousand birds as it does 200. <clears throat> Certainly that's how we have ended up in a uh, commercial type of uh, red meat industry uh, as it is. Now certainly we're not talking about that kind of increase but it's true and I think we all know it to be true that we can um, decrease some of our costs by spreading them uh, over more units uh, produced within some uh, reasonable number. So I'll have the link to this one uh, for you as well. I'm going to bounce back here. There's another, there's another link. That I think is an interesting read. It's out of the Kansas Rural Center. We'll come back to the slide in a minute, but I want to go ahead and open this one because I think this one kind of summarizes things and, and puts them in a, in a nutshell for us as to things that we need to think about with uh, direct marketing on poultry. <clears throat> so this is out of the, the Kansas Rural Center. It's published back in May of 2000. But this uh, really goes through some things that I've, I talked about in our first webinar and uh, some things that, uh, that I think are important. And it's kind of the, what, what do you, how do you approach this? And we've talked about uh, product differentiation, uh, what makes your product different uh, from, from your neighbor's product, what makes it different from what you buy at the store, from a, a commercial product. Um, talks about relationship marketing which obviously a lot of people that are selling in this business are doing word of mouth and uh, you, you have a more a lot of times a process or a producer or a processor uh, has a personal relationship with the people that they sell to and that creates a loyalty over time uh, there's some uh, uh, reference in here to regulations that we've talked about already uh, regarding on-farm slaughter uh, who do you need to talk to within your state, that kind of thing. Um, some of the product promotion. If you, uh, Those of you that were on with us in the first one, we had the three um, case studies and uh, those folks went through and sat with their consultant and they talked about what market did they want to capture, uh, how were they going to put together um, promotion materials and, and those of you that saw those, um, that information got to see the actual um, colored promotional print materials uh, that were created with that consultant to sell the product. And uh, I think you notice that uh, most of those in those um, 
case studies were very happy with that product as it came out. But this discussion, I think, is very um, straightforward. Uh, it talks a little bit about some case study in here. Uh, it gives you some, um, draws some corollaries to some other things in life as to how to approach um, making promotional materials. And, and like here's one for example, it talks about this cooperator in Kansas raised the price from $1.44 to $1.60 a pound. A few customers refused to pay at the higher price, but overall he ended up selling more broilers than he did the last the previous year. Um, so it's it's testing your market, knowing how much that that you can, uh, how much increase that uh, you can bear, which that goes back to that spreadsheet that we have that talks about well what does it cost to make these birds? How do I produce them? Uh, some other things <clears throat> related to the small business aspect that I have mentioned previously, uh, liability issues. Uh, carrying uh, insurance uh, for being at a farmer's market, for people being on your farm. Uh, some of these are things that we don't think about often until it's too late. Um, there's reference here, as we can see as we go through, to the business plan, uh, working in a cooperative, so getting some coordination between yourself and another producer uh, may be an opportunity. And then there's, uh, there's some references here uh, that uh, can point you in the right direction. Uh, so this is kind of a, it's a neat uh, a lay kind of uh, publication that can get some people thinking uh, about some questions that they need to answer uh, related to their, their participation in this uh, small poultry market or direct marketing. I'm going to go back to our slide here. I think the pricing thing, sometimes it's a, it's a kind of a tough task. Uh, certainly need to be aware of what, what other direct marketers are charging in your geography. Um, and there's a real, I think even more so uh, in the poultry than in the other red meats, there's a real broad range of, uh, of pricing. Um, Debbie, you had mentioned Show Me, they sell, uh, they sell birds. and. Uh, there's a pretty big uh, differential between their pricing and, and some others uh, in the area. But it depends on what you're wanting to pay for, uh, what's important to the consumer. And uh, you, know, you want to be in the, in the ballpark, but if you have a product that's uh, differentiated uh, for some, some other reason and that value is there, then I think certainly by all means you, you can afford to pay the higher price. It goes back to this uh, Making sure that the folks that we deal with know what it, know, that they know what it costs to do business, whether it's from a production, promotion, distribution. Um, if you're not in front of your break-even price, you're in trouble. Um, I think that's just common sense. But we we have consumers that are willing to pay higher prices if there are specifications that they're demanding, and um, whether it has to do with the quality of the product or how the the animals are raised. And uh, you know, I think that the husbandry issue is going to become a, a bigger one in the near future, especially given some of the legislation that's passed in the state of California related to uh, cage laying operations. So, uh, if if you have a consumer that and you're willing and able to meet their specifications, then by all means, because you've you've done something above and beyond, uh, you certainly need to be uh, rewarded for that. And, uh, having a higher priced product is one of the ways for that to occur. Okay. Debbie, that kind of brings me, that's my my, my last slide related to um, this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we've got a fair bit of time here where we can have some discussion if folks have questions. and. Uh, we, we can uh, open Okay, that thanks, up. Brian. Um, anybody got some questions out there they want to ask? Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, anybody got some questions out there they want to ask? Okay, well, I do have something I just kind of want to bring up and ask because I wasn't sure how to handle this. I had purchased some poultry from a producer and would go to the farm and pick up the poultry 
and it was kind of like a CSA where you paid so much and then you went throughout the growing season when he slaughtered um, and picked up the, the poultry and brought it back and so I had some in the freezer uh, for a while that lasted through the winter and every time I fixed the, the bird um, of the four people in my family, three of us, it was fine, but the fourth one always ended up with a little bit of diarrhea afterwards. And he told me he never wanted birds again from a farmer. The following year, I got birds from a person who actually had it at a processing facility. And we had no problems at all whatsoever as far as um, the digestion of this other person. And so if something like that happens, how do we handle that type of a situation? All I did was go to a diff I bought from a different producer uh, the following year. And what birds I had left, I just told this person, don't eat the chicken today. <laughs> Should we be reporting things like that? Um, I'm assuming that this person was under the 1,000 exemption, so there was no state inspection of his processing. Do you want to make or anybody have any comments or thoughts about that? I might reserve my comments for a minute. I don't know, Dr. Clark, I hate to put you on the spot, but uh, I didn't know if you had anything uh, that you'd like to add to that. Certainly we're a little bit in your area with the, the food safety aspect. I don't, I don't know about the, the, uh, the reporting aspect. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, I don't have a solid opinion for you on this yes. particular situation, but yeah, food, food safety is always going to be an important thing, and it's just... I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later, Debbie. That'll be fine. Sorry for the rest of the audience. Uh, that's perfectly fine. He's no longer in business anymore, uh, raising birds, but I just didn't know if that was something I needed or how, as a consumer, if someone comes up to you, how do you handle that? You just, I wasn't sure what to do either. So, but we can talk about that later. No one has any questions or comments out there? No Stacy, go ahead. Stacy. Uh, I thought the trailer that had the slaughter facilities on it was very unique. Uh, the equipment and the things that was on that trailer, are they readily available? That's a good question, Stacy. Uh, I've been in contact with the folks uh, at Kentucky uh, to find out, but I, I think that they are. There are some, uh, I guess what I'll call aftermarket uh, short line uh, manufacturers out there, and I'm trying to put together uh, just a short list of where that information can, where, where that those types of uh, equipment can be uh, garnered. Uh, some of that is just um, like those killing cones and things of that nature, those are uh, manufactured specifically for poultry. But I've seen some modifications on killing cones, and, and I don't know if some of you have seen this, but uh, I've actually seen one of these with a, they're actually road cones, uh, purchased road cones from a construction company where they, they just retrofitted them for that. Um, the Scald Tank um, is an easy one. Probably the, the one that's a, a specialty item is the, the uh, defeathering. Um, uh, apparatus there that has the fingers in it and that saves a lot of time if you've ever had to pluck, pluck birds but um, I will I, I'm going to try to on some follow-up information Stacy I'm going to try to find some information on that where we have some of the manufacturers of those items because I think if you look at it <coughs> um, it doesn't look like a very difficult design um, to, to put something like that together uh, the key obviously is to make sure it's under sanitary conditions uh, for a mobile unit, but uh, you know, beyond that, um, I think a lot of that is, um, you know, has been borrowed and retrofitted from other. See, when you was uh, when you talking about the defeathering of it, I thought that was pretty unique. Uh, some of the people that I knew that just done poultry on the farm and this kind of thing, instead of uh, removing feathers or plucking them, they uh, they skinned the chickens. Is there a big difference in in preference on that or you know I know that we're used to seeing chickens plucked in the markets right 
I, I'm going to speak from a, as a meat scientist now, maybe from a, a, a meat quality standpoint. The nice thing about a, a bird that's got its skin on, you get some insulating factor, especially if that bird's going to go into frozen storage. Um, the uh, the other aspect of it is that the vast majority of the flavor in a bird is in its skin, uh, and a lot of the fat component uh, is there as well. So. Uh, just from a, a cold storage or especially a frozen storage, I think the preference would be to have the skin on those and uh, have a plucked bird. Uh, and I agree with you, Stacy. A lot of the people I deal with, because of that that whole aspect of dealing with plucking a bird and pin feathers and things of this nature, uh, it is easier to skin them. But I think that'll decrease your uh, your frozen storage time and probably decrease the uh, flavor flavorful uh, aspects of, of birds, especially if you're trying to sell poultry uh, based on the fact that uh, maybe they're they're a free-range poultry or they're uh, for lack of a better word grazing poultry uh, and you're trying to sell that that forage profile uh, I think they'll have to be a, a plucked bird. I sir, certainly appreciate I just your make insights comment. into that. Go ahead Stacy. sorry. Well I, I you know, I hadn't thought about the difference in storage quality and, you know, from the standpoint of the meat side side of it, but it's it's great, Debbie, to have a, a guy here that has an opinion along that lines and that would maybe send us a direction that we don't want to go uh, and just take the extra problems of plucking a chicken and, and going on with it. I would like to add, just so, so folks are aware if you're not, that we do have a mobile processing poultry unit in Missouri. It's located with the Green Hills Farm Project, and it's up in the north central part of the state. It's a group of graziers that are up there, and it is owned by their organization for their members. I have not seen that unit, so I can't describe it to you whatsoever. Has anybody that's on here um, been to Green Hills and has seen that unit? Um, I know Crystal, I, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but I know that you're, you work some with some of those folks up there. I do know um, the person who mainly keeps it at his place and I could always um, ask him if he has some pictures and maybe he might be able to send them and then um, perhaps uh, post them out on the website as well. Debbie, I was going to suggest that actually I was, <coughs> we were going to try to, uh, I was going to try to get up there and actually take pictures of that and, and put that in some of our follow-up materials for this, this particular webinar. So, um, yeah, let's uh, <coughs> stay in contact on that. I, I okay. think that would be good that for everybody good. to be able to see it. Um, there are some other, uh, as um, Brian had mentioned, I know that there's a, the famous one, or at least in my mind, uh, the two that always come to my mind are the ones that he talked about in Kentucky and the ones over in um, Washington. And I know um, next week at the National Small Farm Conference in Illinois, the Washington State Mobile Processing Unit is going to have a poster up. And so hopefully those of us that are on that are going over there might be able to glean a little bit more information uh, from the folks from Washington State. Are there any other questions? There's one one website that I might uh, make everybody aware of, and uh, you may or may not know these folks. Um, let me sh share the page with you here, and I'll have this in your information. <coughs> but uh, some of you may or may not know these folks, if it, or have heard of the Peace Valley Poultry. Um, <coughs> this is uh, uh, what I think is a really well done uh, home page web page, um, and uh, these folks process birds there and they have uh, pickup locations and I, I think this is a well organized one and uh, Stacy we may have been talking uh, in the first webinar about some materials and things that folks do to to sell and what would I consider some high quality I think this is a, a, a nicely designed uh, web page here um, click to the order section 
Uh, you can see that they have uh, sales and they're down in the Springfield area, but Springfield, Mansfield, Rolla, uh, they have a nice geography laid out uh, when they're uh, having product available. And uh, you know, here on the 2009 season, we have 250 a pound picked up at the farm. And they actually are set up to, for delivery uh, to certain places in southern Missouri for another 25 cents per pound. <coughs> so uh, I think this is, uh, this is kind of a, a, a well-designed well website. Uh, and I, I would probably point some people to this if they're thinking about trying to look at some of this web marketing or uh, aspects of that as well. So just something I thought I'd, I'd uh, uh, add in there. Any other comments or questions? Okay, I think what we'll do is go ahead and um, round this out. Uh, I just want to let you know that out on the Missouri SARE website, I do have the PowerPoints and um, any additional information, whether it's a URL link, a website, or a PDF file, or an Excel file for webinar one and two. The recordings are not there yet, but I do have um, the supplemental information. And I hope to have, as soon as Brian sends me all of his information, we'll get that up for the third webinar. And then I will go ahead and try to um, get the recordings up there for you as well so you might want to keep checking back on that um, for those of you who may not know the URL for that is extension.missouri.edu forward slash SARE S-A-R-E and then on the left side of the page towards the top there will be a link that says um, trainings and workshop past trainings and workshop information or something along in that line is what it's titled and so all previous information and trainings done with SARE and funded by SARE are listed there there are still some that we need to add up but under the direct marketing link on that page you will find webinars one and two already so um, Bruce you had your hand up there Okay, um, I'm not aware. Any last minute questions or comments? Okay, if you all felt that doing webinars, a series of web, short webinars along this line on a specific topic was extremely helpful for you, and you would like to see continued webinars on other topics of interest, whether it be uh, related around food, energy, a specific type of a discipline, whether you know it's agronomy or horticulture, um, we're capable of doing these in the future. So by all means, please go ahead and um, email me some thoughts or comments of future trainings that you might like to have through the SARE PDP training. And with this, I'd like to say thank you both to Brian and to Andrew for leading us and teaching us on direct marketing of meat. And I want to say thank you also to those of you who have participated. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you later.